include all of those, we kind of need an umbrella name, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we recognize as Indigenous people, there's a lot more than just that that Canada recognizes. So there's a complexity there that we have to think about when we were doing the MOOC as well. Uh, people ask us why we use just the four, the four nations, and we thought geographically they were a really good fit uh, to talk about Canada. But we need to recognize that there is a huge complexity in trying to cram this type of history into one course. So uh, lots of comments about uh, you didn't talk about this, you didn't talk about enough, or you talked about too much. So we accessed our elders, we accessed our knowledge keepers, and uh, for three years working on this MOOC, trying to get as much information from as many community members as we could. And this is what we came up with. So, um, Fantastic. People are telling me to mute. Sorry, I don't know what that means. <laughs> is there an audio sound or mute mute me <laughs> no mute me and I'm like I don't see a mute button I'm so sorry um well I and I think that you know people are also just down below I'm seeing in terms of the United States and Canada in terms of what you're you're talking about in terms of of of, of titles and names is it the same application or is it different between Canada and the United States um Yes, uh, Canada has uh, a similar history to the US, but um, we are very different in fact that we signed uh, the numbered treaties across Canada. So there is a little bit of a different history. And I think for Canada, the recognition of um, through the Constitution, through the, well, the Indian Act is another issue, uh, that I think we have a lot of um, similarities, but mostly uh, Canada, in itself um, has a recognition um, of Aboriginal people, Aboriginal title. Um, so we can see a little bit of different uh, naming. I know when I'm down in the States, they, I can hear, you know, in public, they call uh, Native Americans Indians or they use Native American. But in general, across the, the globe, Indigenous communities, including, you know, uh, Native Americans in the US, Canadians, Maori from uh, New Zealand, Hawaiians, you know, we generally talk about ourselves academically, anyway, in academic circles, as Indigenous peoples, as a whole. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, it, it, in terms of um, the specificity of words and the specificity of language, I think it's, it's, it's really important for people to know that those, the words and the way that we, people want to be re referred to is really, um, integral and important to uh, communities. Um, it's not mm -hmm. something to be taken kind of lightly or for granted. Um, and speaking of words, I think so many of the, the questions that came in um, over the past week were about the, the um, subject of storytelling, which is, which is sort of a huge focus of, of the week's lesson. Um, and, and the power that it has. So in terms of sort of some of the questions that people had, um, did you wanna kind of address generally um, some of the, the more common themes that were coming up in the, in the questions that people had? Sure, um, but before we do that, do you mind if I talk a little bit, uh, begin with the story? Of course. Okay. Uh, I've got permission to share this uh, with the elder we worked at, worked with on the MOOC, uh, Reuben Quinn, if you guys remember him, mm -hmm. told us the stories of the uh, spirit markers. So right before we were to um, interview Reuben, he wanted to smudge. And so I'm all stressed out because we're in Pemina Hall, we have a sprinkler system. I'm like, oh, Reuben, I don't think we can do that because, you know, I don't have permission. And he's like, Hey, don't worry about that, he says. He says, all you need is a little bit. Because I thought the sprinklers would rain down on us from all the smoke. And so what he did, what Ruben did, was take this little, a little tiny piece of smudge, a little tiny sage. He's like, that's all you need, my girl, just a little bit. Because they, it's the intent that it is. You don't need a big giant piece of smudge smoking out the building. All you need is this little bit, and the ancestors will hear you. And so um, I love to share that story because 
I came into that. In I'm sorry. I do think that that was the clearest and uh, and um, most kind of impactful explanation of smudging. Mm. I think people, and and it's interesting just to to interject in terms of what the conversation was and and and, and the intention factor that you were talking about. It's interesting that smudge sticks are sold in these huge bundles and we've been become accustomed to, you know, setting ablaze our homes with trying to get, you know, bad energy out or, or all of these things that almost in a way feel very surface. And mm. I think there was something so meaningful about saying it only needs, you only need one little piece. It's the intention behind it. Mm -hmm. That is the power. So yeah. um, there's something really kind of symbolic in that that I think is um, particularly right now is, is worth really taking to heart. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we get started on talking about the storytelling thing, Dan, I'd like to know how you're doing on the, uh, on the course and uh, is anything bubbling up in your, in your brain um, as you go through it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think it's been, first of all, I mean, from just a storytelling perspective in terms of how the course is laid out, I found it to be so, um, you know, easy to follow in a way that was really um, um, emotional and artistic mm -hmm. and celebrated the music and the sounds and the, um, the words. The storytelling element to me, I think, was, was really powerful. And, you know, I think in a way we are aware of the power that stories hold, but it wasn't until um, you're con kind of confronted with a story like Turtle Island, where you realize how important these um, stories are in grounding us to our planet, you know, because oftentimes I think we can get very distracted by materialism in a way that doesn't, that distracts us from realizing that, you know, in a, in a matter of speaking, we are standing on the back of a turtle. We are standing on, on earth that beneath mm -hmm. the skyscrapers, beneath the office buildings, beneath our computers and our, you know, our homes is earth. And that connection I think gets lost often and, and frequently because we are so, so easily distracted. So just being re-immersed in the importance of storytelling and how storytelling really acts as, as a guardian of trying to protect that which is sacred um, really had such an impact on me and also the concept of storytelling versus what outsiders describe as folklore and the importance mm. of words and the power again going back to the power of words and you know I think as a gay person there are words that affect me in ways that other people don't see um, there are triggering words that that kind of chip away at my community, you know, in a way that a lot of people are blind to. So to have that laid out so clearly, the idea that folklore in a way is kind of undermining or what I took it as, as kind of disrespecting the significance mm -hmm. of storytelling to the communities. Um, that was a really big takeaway and just how careful we have to be about what we say because those mm -hmm. words have power. And the more that we wor use those words incorrectly, the more that we continue to chip away at, at communities and at cultures. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. And, and I think um, stories are incredibly powerful. And we have, you know, our Cherokee uh, writer, Thomas King, who talks about the truth about stories. And in fact, you know, when you do say them, you can't take them back. You can't bring mm -hmm. them back. And so... They're incredibly uh, rich, but they're also they can be incredibly dangerous as well. So, um, some we have two stories, as you know, the Sky Woman and the, the Wasaki Jack story. And uh, so, imagine our um, imagine the story, the plethora of stories that we had to choose from. So, we thought those two would be a really good example to talk about um, the creation story. A lot of people um, are really familiar, obviously, with the Bible and the flood. And it's really quite stunning how across the globe, indigenous peoples um, have flood stories as well. Um, so Maori have a flood story. And so we see in, for Cree culture, Wasaki Jack has a flood story uh, as well. 
So it's all across the board. And so we thought maybe people would be able to engage a little bit more. Everybody loves stories. You know, when mm-hmm. you're a little kid, you have your parents telling you stories, you have books. And so telling stories um, is a really good way to bring people in under this big umbrella of humanity, right? Um, but speaking to what you said about um, how stories can get perhaps uh, changed or moved, um, just want to talk a little bit about that. You know, we have some stories that take years to tell in our culture, um, and you don't get them all right away. For instance, a Sky Woman story, that could take um, hours and hours to tell, depending on the storyteller. Or you could condense it to like a Reader's Digest version. But it's really important to recognize that there's, um, as far as my teachings go, and I have to add this caveat that um, as far as reaching as we try to be with gathering knowledge across Canada uh, from Indigenous people, you know, we did distill it down and uh, any mistakes are clearly, you know, my own. Um, and I want to give credit to all the people that have helped us, you know, create this MOOC throughout the years. Mm-hmm. So all the mistakes, you know, are mine. Uh, and these are just from my, my teachings. What I see, um, what I have been told about uh, stories is that, in fact, there's two kinds of stories. There's a sacred story, Eto Keowina. I'm sorry for my Cree teachers that I'm maybe messing up our language. And then there's family stories. And the sacred stories are ones that um, are given to you. So you're given the right to tell those stories. So what the generational, um, and you said you have generational stories as well. Mm -hmm. So what this um, encompasses is that generation to generation, you're told the same story. And then that great grandparent passes it on to the grandparent parent and and child and as it goes. So that story they want to keep, for lack of a better word, uh, a pure. And so you're told the story story you tell the story back and then finally once you get it right then you're allowed to tell the story and those are sacred stories they don't change and then we have family stories of course um so family stories you can change you know uh who pushed um the sister down the stairs well it wasn't me it was my brother or the brother says no that was tracy so those kinds of stories you can change so when we see stories like Sky Woman and the Wasaki Jack story, um, we heard these stories from a multitude of people and then had made sure that we had it right so that we could put them in the MOOC. There are also uh, challenges with that. In fact, when we don't tell, for Cree people, we don't tell Wasaki Jack stories in the summer. We only tell them in the winter. And so what happens when you put it on the internet? You know, we had so many uh, discussions about that. Should we or shouldn't we? So what are the benefits Mm. and what are the risks of that? Um, Obviously, the end decision was we need to share this story with with people on this. Um, And so uh, with many of us, the idea was lots of us living outside communities um, and not having access to stories in the way that they were meant to be told live with a storyteller. Um, what are the possibilities and the dangers of putting it out on the internet? People are going to read it or say it out loud, you know, during the summer. We thought that the benefits would override the risks uh, in that. And so we decided to share. But people need to understand too um, there is contextualization when it comes to stories. Uh, there's scaffolding and learning that happens, right? So mm-hmm. when you start off um, talking to a child about how to do things, you're not going to tell them right away. And I give the example of math because I'm not good at math. So, you know, I learned math one plus one, and you start off slow. And then the math teacher moves you up, and all of a sudden they throw numbers in there at, with the letters. And that's when you lost me. But Stories are the same way. It's scaffolds, right? And so you're you're getting deeper and deeper meanings as you go along. The danger of putting a story out on a book or on the internet is that people will take it out of context. And so um, it's really important um, that people recognize that, that stories can be uh, taken out of context. And we tried our best to make sure that the story was as close to what we heard as possible. 
And I think that's, I think in the, in this age of, 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 of the idea of appropriation and that really being at the forefront of conversations right now, in terms of people sharing these stories, who is really supposed to be sharing these stories and who isn't? Let me just put on my crown of telling who can do what. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. there are things that are quite sacred to, to cultures and to communities that I feel like we have just so flippantly been able to, to take and run with. And I think it's about honoring the communities and realizing um, that certain things should just be left to be told within those communities and not uh, to be shared outside of them. So that was just yeah. something kind of ultimately that I was curious about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I think uh, indigenous stories been appropriated, they've been mm -hmm. censored sanitized um, and even bastardized uh, because they were deemed maybe noxious, offensive, or degenerate. Uh, and so we see an example and uh, of um, it's oftenly, often told as the woman who married the bear. So you can Google it and you'll see lots of stories on there of a woman that married a bear. Well, this has changed a lot from the oral story that I've heard um, growing up. So the woman didn't marry the bear. So what happens is a woman insults the bear. And for her to learn a lesson about the importance of respecting all living things, uh, he charms her. And then they go on to have hot, sweaty sex together. And then they have baby bears as a result. I'm very much shortening this story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then she ultimately understands intimately um, that the bear's uh, needs to be respected and deserve that, that respect because we're all interconnected. But we see through the ages how the church and Christianity sort of played a role in sanitizing this story. It was certainly important for the church to have the bear marry the woman before mm. they have sex and to legalize somehow this cross-species sex. So you can see how that was sanitized sorry, to, for the taste of the day. And so this has happened with a lot of our stories going down the way. If people are looking for, I guess, authentic or genuine um, Indigenous stories, uh, I guess what I would tell them is look at who the author is. Uh, are they an Indigenous person? Mm. Look at the publisher. Uh, there's a lot of Indigenous, indigenous publishing companies out there. Um, they're going to make sure that those stories are um, genuine or coming from a, a place where that person has the right to tell that story. Great. And hopefully by the end of this, I know that we've been talking about this too, hopefully making a, a place where we can um, compile some supplementary material for people to, to read too. So that's something that we will mm. hopefully work on um, over the, the 12 weeks that we do this as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I know that um, also just in terms of, of what, why we were, are, are, are studying this course, why this course is important. Um, we had this conversation um, yesterday when we were talking just in advance of mm -hmm. why it's important to learn um, this history um, from this perspective. And we're, again, we're in a culture of people saying, what about me? You know, all <laughs> lives matter, <sighs> which, mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't even need to touch, but you know, um, what is, what is your take on, on all of that? Hmm. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. And we do get a lot and you see things like that come across social media, uh, especially with black lives matter. And, you know, my colleague, Dr. Paul Garo, um, did some really great interviews to talk about how there was a huge uh, uptick, um, for indigenous Canada during the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And if you make those connections, I think you're seeing people wanting to explore other knowledges that are in, in Canada. We're having an insight where, hey, we're just getting this certain kind of knowledge at us constantly. Is it what else is there out there? How else can I improve my humanity? How can I be a better human by understanding people that may not look like me that may be different from me. And mm -hmm. so you see, you know, non, I guess, black people going to Black Lives Matter. 
it's the same thing of, you know, um, non-Indigenous people taking Indigenous Canada just to see another perspective. We really worked hard on just completely bringing uh, Indigenous Canada from an Indigenous perspective. And so when people, we hope, when people are um, taking the course, that they're able to understand that this is completely from uh, an Indigenous worldview. And this is why we start the module with a, a worldview, so people kind of get settled into it. Okay, this is what we're looking at. We don't have this um, non-Indigenous lens, this white lens or a settler lens. This is an Indigenous lens. So to come in there... We really tried to make the MOOC uh, as vibrant, as engaging as we possibly could. And as you know, there's some hard things to learn mm -hmm. as, as we go along. But going back to your sort of original question about um, what about me? Like, don't I matter? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think all the learners that are taking the, the Indigenous canon matter. Um, and what matters is your self-reflection on, on not only who you are but the space that you inhabit and the people that are around you the you know the schools that your child is going to has indigenous children there they have black children there. they have people of color children of color there mm -hmm. and so improving ourselves uh, in this world of covid <clears throat> not just by learning how to bake awesome bread or mm -hmm. learning how to knit socks which are great Mm -hmm. But also to improve your mind, you know, and get a better understanding of what's out there. I know that for, for me, this is, it's, I'm, you know, I'm learning a lot of this embarrassingly late in the game. And I think mm -hmm. it's important to acknowledge that this should have been taught to me, uh, you know, very early on in the educational process. We're very lucky to have this course. We're very lucky mm -hmm. to have you here to, to, to continue these lessons. Um, but ultimately, these are stories that are crucial to the identity of our country. And so, you know, it, it, there's really no excuse for how late this is, is coming. But I do hope that in the process of learning, we can help to, 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 again, as I said, recontextualize our place in all of this. Because a lot of, a lot of people have gotten lost in the sense that I feel like they have lost their context mm -hmm. and lost their place. Um, and have mm -hmm. got, have received this sort of very false sense of entitlement, um, when in mm -hmm. actuality we owe so much to the people who were here. Um, so that is uh, that's I think important to recognize that you know this is an incredibly important course to take. But you know, for me, it's 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 inexcusable how late this came in my education. Um, mm. So. In terms of, of other questions that have come in, is there anything else you wanted to, to, to add? Um, hmm. I guess some of the comments um, I, wa I want to add, and it, it sort of um, touches on what you just said about, you know, being late in the game and mm -hmm. things. And, you know, teaching at the Faculty of Native Studies and, and the students, they, especially the non-Indigenous students, um, they feel a sense of guilt or shame uh, when they learn about this, it's uh, it makes them uncomfortable. We're touching on some white fragility a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what I tell my students, what I want to tell um, you learners, is that's not the point of, of Indigenous Canada. What we actually want as Indigenous people is to share and celebrate our culture, to share all of this with you, um, mm -hmm. not just the history that you know can be really uncomfortable for people, but our music and our artists and our stories um, to make you better aware of how we can more be more human with each other and make this place a better a better place um, for our children, you know, and people growing up. It would be such a dream if if I could send my grandchildren into school knowing that they wouldn't experience the racism that I did. That. Mm -hmm. Kids would ask them, wow, look at your powwow outfit. Can I come to the powwow? Can I see that? Your language is so cool. So we really want to um, land on a place of celebration of, of cultures. Um, and there might be some guilt or shame that comes from it, but I, I got to let people know that it, guilt and shame doesn't really 
resources you have um, and then going forward with the Indigenous Canada or even other resources that, um, is a, a fantastic step uh, towards a better humanity. I could, could not have possibly said it better. And I do think that, you know, again, touching back on how this, how this could shape early education as well. I mean, there's just so much beauty and there's so much fundamental kind of spiritual impact in these stories, even just in the first lesson, in the in the sounds that we're hearing, in the stories that we're, mm. we're being told. Um, you know, it, it is quite quite profound. And and um, you know, in terms of um, next week, is there is there kind of some um, insight into what we can look forward to in, in next week's lesson? Sure. So you've got world views under your belt. And so I think the next one is fur trade. I'm looking over here, fur trade. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so fur trade is really an amazing uh, module too. And this is where the part where we see Indigenous people um, uh, meeting non-Indigenous people for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. You won't see uh, uh, a lot of, um, I guess, um, clashing at first. So a lot of people might not know that there were um, a lot of friendly relations. I'm calling out to you, Métis people, uh, happening um, around the fur trade. And so we'll, we'll get into that. And uh, it'll be really great to touch base with you next week and, and see how you Absolutely. like Absolutely. And to all of you who are watching right now we're going to try and figure out how best to do these weekly lessons we started this week on instagram live some other um people who will be joining the discussion and that might yeah. seem like a better uh place to do that so please uh keep on top of um my social media channels you could go to ua native studies um which is the handle for the Native Studies uh, faculty at, at University of Alberta. We're going to be putting all the information out all through um, through those social media channels. So if it does move to Zoom, um, just keep an eye out for that. Um, but Dr. Tracy Bear, thank you so much for this incredible 45 minutes. I'm so glad we were able to make it happen in the end. <laughs> and um, 